All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, this is a panel discussion that uh, when this was originally envisioned, we, we thought we'd all be in a room with you and uh, be able to take some questions and, and talk about it. But there, our thought was really about talking, having a discussion from multiple different perspectives about getting the equipment that you want on a project. And obviously the you and the type of equipment is different from each perspective. Um, but ultimately I think it, it uh, uh, kind of comes down to how do we make the project and equipment selection as painless as possible for all parties uh, as we do construction projects. Um, so we have a pretty good panel here. Uh, my name is Dan Garbley. I'm a principal engineer at Clean Water Services. Um, we also have Brett Riestad, who, uh, who's a senior engineer at Jacobs. Uh, Rob Beckloff, who's a senior project manager at Sladen Constructions. Uh, Jeff Stallard, project manager at Water Environment Services. And Chris McCaleb, owner at Treatment Equipment Company. So uh, I think the way we're gonna do this is I have a few questions that I'm gonna uh, start to kind of uh, facilitate a conversation. And then if you guys have any questions in the audience, we'll kind of add on to the conversation. So I'm gonna start from the beginning with the engineering of a project. Uh, and so starting with Brett, um, from an engineering perspective, what do you think is the best way to procure uh, equipment? Uh, the easiest for design, bidding, bringing the project all the way uh, through completion. And additionally, you know, how hard is it typically uh, to re-engineer with equipment uh, that contractors select on bid day. Yeah, Dan, I guess I'd start by saying it depends on the nature of the piece of equipment. Uh, you know, for, I'd say for more simple equipment, I think the you know, design bid build approach works fine with named equipment. Um, but for more complicated systems, um, again, we've had project examples with Jeff and Dan here, cogeneration engines, centrifuges, larger packaged equipment with package control systems, lots of interfaces, both control and piping wise, that um, knowing what equipment we're going to get during design is very helpful to having a, uh, a robust uh, set of contract documents to bid to the construction contractors. Um, and, that, and so that takes you to an owner pre-select or an owner procure type uh, method for that. And the other benefit about that is that it, it gets puts the owner more in the driver's seat on putting requirements on uh, the nature of that piece of equipment and ultimately the selection of that equipment. The downfall, of course, with that process is it takes more involvement from the owner in that process, and it, it can increase schedule uh, as that that process to develop the requirements to put out a request for proposal, go through that evaluation and selection, um, and the addition of perhaps the legal department and procuring department um, adds into that schedule. I think, I think in general, again, having knowing what that equipment is, if we can get that done so that preliminary shop drawing information from that selected vendor can be used to complete the design, uh, makes for a, again, a, a very solid, thorough uh, set of contract documents for contractors to bid. The second part of your question is, well, you know, what, what's, the, what's the, the pain, I guess, of re-engineering for other than a named vendor or first name designed around vendor? And again, that depends on the, the, the piece of the equipment. Uh, sometimes it's, it's very straightforward. Things are very similar sized, similar piping connections. It's, it's not a problem. Uh, we can just roll with that at shop drawing time. Um, for it, again, for these larger pieces of equipment where uh, you know, some, some centrifuges have their feed end reversed between two machines. And so piping has to change. Sometimes chutes have to change, platforms have to change. And so that, that puts another layer of, you know, essentially almost a change order that has to happen, a design modification that has to happen during construction to address that, that vendor. So if you did do that sort of approach, um, Rob, I, the, the contractor's generally on the hook for a lot of those changes to accommodate some of these alternatives and such. Um, 
So how do you, as a contractor during bid time, um, when you're kind of, you're, you're, you're trying to look at selecting either the A name or an alternative, how do you account for those potential changes uh, and the costs associated with redesign? So that depends on a couple of different things. The first thing is uh, who's repping the equipment, depending on who you're working with uh, during the bid period, that can, that can play a big part in deciding how those costs are handled. Uh, if it's a rep that you work with all the time and have a good relationship with, uh, they're a lot more willing to you know, work through issues with you and try and figure out what actual costs might be. If it's more of a one-off piece of equipment that you, know, you don't deal with uh, the people that rep that and they don't know you, they're typically less willing to dive in and help you work through all the details. Uh, another issue with that is typically you don't get scope letters until the last few hours before the bid is due. So, you know, how are you supposed to work through all these issues in, you know, say four or six hours when you're getting maybe three or four different scopes and you have to go through each one and figure out what the differences might be. Uh, so it's tough. Uh, typically, if somebody does put the time in to uh, work through all these issues and does include those costs in their bid, then they're not the low bidder. Uh, if, if you put all those costs in there, you won't get the job. Rob, I guess I, I got a question for you on that. Then, you know, we talk about getting bids in just two hours before, you know, your bids are due from some consultants. So I know in a panel that was the last time we were live at PNCWA at the, the, um, the conference was a discussion about bid time periods. And so I guess would lengthening the bid time period, knowing if we have a base bid requirement in there, provide any, you know, any relief on that? Or do you still anticipate that you would be getting your quite prices in two hours before you have to submit your bids? For some vendors and some pieces of equipment, it could make a difference, but for others, it won't. Okay. So Chris, what's your perspective on this as a manufacturer? Um, you know, if you are not the A named or, you know, first named um, piece of equipment in the spec, but you're wanting to get the job, um, how, how, how are you engaging uh, with the Robs of the world, the contractors um, to really do that uh, work and get those costs in such a way that you might actually win the job, um, but also without, you know, spending a bunch of money um, that you're not going to recoup. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things that come into play. Is one is, is kind of evaluating the relationship with client, um, making sure that um, you know from our standpoint, there's nothing more than we want to make sure we have a good installation potentially if we do win the project. Um, so if the clients went through a process with the consultant, they really know what they want. Um, it's a balancing act between our standpoint and the manufacturer to to determine. Um, you know, how, how uh, hungry they are and, and persuasive to try to bid into a project, right? Um, we don't want to be somewhere that we're not. So first, we have to evaluate that. Is it, good, is it a good fit? Um, usually, there's some dialogue that happens both at the, the uh, contractor level and maybe with the client and the consultant. So those three pieces all together. Um, and then if it seems like it's something where they really want competition and they view that what you have is an or equal and it could go through that process and it's designed that way um, from the specification and the project, uh, then we'll engage with the, with the manufacturer. And some manufacturers are much more lenient than other ones. Uh, some of them are pretty much, you know, if they're not A-listed or sole sourced, uh, <laughs> they view that they're just not gonna waste their time. Other ones understand that those those times maybe that happened 20, 30 years ago are not as prevalent as they are now. It's much more competitive. So they're willing to go through those extra steps, answer the questions, supply the information, put the packages together to make sure it's comprehensive. So everybody involved can really understand what, what's being uh, pushed forward, right? Yeah. So I'm going to stay with you, Chris. But how how do different the different delivery methods um, also affect um, your spec the specifications for a project? So so if a design bid build or an alternative uh, delivery method, 
how does how can you impact the specification uh, and the project design support uh, as a manufacturer's rep? Right. So one of the unique aspects that I have uh, that I bring to the tables that I was on the client side for you know almost twenty years. So I, I really never thought about it. Now being on this side of the fence, understanding the total impacts of what a project entails from the consultant to the manufacturer to the client, what's being asked and how you get it to the finish line. Um, and I would say with the conventional design bid build, um, depending on um, you know, what the process is involved on the project, um, it's very important that it's communicated, one, what the goal is, uh, how much efforts are going to happen um, to supply information to the consultant. So is there going to be a pre-selection? Now, in conventional design bid, it's usually something is, is listed with or equals or it's a, a me too spec, right? Uh, and, and going through that process, pretty easy from our standpoint. There's not a lot of information that's selected because it's pretty open. Um, and so, you know, those, those are pretty much sharp in the pencil at the end of the day uh, on bid day and, and make sure that you're hungry if you want the project. Um, once you get into the um, alternative deliveries where maybe there's a pre-selection or there's an A-listing, there's a sole source procurement, um, some of those other methods, uh, it's much easier because maybe there's more of a design piece up front with the consultant where they're going to really get into some middle level engineering questions, some of those things that are beyond a proposal level and a P and ID, right? Like here's what I'm supplying you, here's a price. So the question really is in each one of those procurement methods, what is the requirement that you're gonna ask the engineer to select a piece of equipment? So I have to say the obvious is being you know, with my history, whether it's on the client side, whether it's the consultant side or the contractor that's even won the project, they're pretty much in a paid capacity where the, the risk um, situation that the sales aspect is on, of course, they don't get paid until they win the project and a lot of times way down the road. So for them to feel stable, to support the project, so information is supplied, so a decision can be navigated and gone through they have to feel stable that one, they're gonna not do all this work. And then at the end of the day, be listed with three other manufacturers as listed. So it's a balancing act, right? Um, I would say that from a manufacturer rep, a manufacturer standpoint, pre-selection, owner uh, procurement, pre-procurement on the project, some of those things really put them in a good situation where they can support whatever level needs to happen on the engineering side to make sure everything is done correctly and the decisions can be made. When it's a conventional design bid build, it's much, much trickier depending on what has to be supplied beyond the proposal and the PNID. Right. So given what you just heard from Chris, um, you know, Jeff, so what would make you as an owner decide on uh, using one of these different um, procurement methods. So a base bid procurement method, or uh, like Chris said, you know, hey, owner furnish that equipment and, and pay me up front, uh, which I'm sure I understand why he prefers that. Um, but how does that impact, you know, from an owner's perspective, how you design, supply, install the equipment um, and what sort of limitations uh, are you working under in terms of procurement rules and things like that to um, allow you to do that in, in for different projects? Sure. I mean, we would, uh, I guess, if I think about the type of delivery we would use, I, I mean, I think of one of the biggest drivers would be schedule for us. Um, how quick do we have to deliver the project? That's where I would think owner furnishing something so we can, you know, get that piece of equipment purchased or under under procurement while we're finishing up the design or or getting a project bid i think a schedule this schedule would drive at least for me personally owner on a decision to go with the owner furnished equipment because i think as the owner when you furnish the equipment you are taking on risk right and so if the 
I, ha I now have a contract with a vendor or a, a equipment supplier. I'll have a contract with a contractor to then install it. And so if something goes wrong with that piece of equipment or it doesn't start up or function properly, the contractor could look to me to pay for any extra extra effort or time that they would have because they don't, you know, all they're doing is installing it, right? And so now I own I own that risk and and short of a schedule for me that that would be what i would gain is a, a quicker quicker schedule if i had a requirement to meet that um in, t in terms of using uh, a base bid approach um and we use this on a res our, on our solids project for major a few pieces of major equipment the cogen engine was one of them as well as our centrifuges and you know the, the driver for that was really having a complete design as brett mentioned earlier different centrifuges have different connection points and different requirements and so to make sure that you have a complete design that's buildable and functional you we need to base our bid on something um uh, and so that's that's when we've leveraged the base bid approach it allows still allows and working with our procurement rules competition because we're not sole sourcing uh, which is a, a really tough um in the public uh, procurement form is a really tough sell to get uh, a, a sole source agreement in place to, to do that. And so um, we, we use base bid. And again, if we were to owner furnished our, our centrifuge, which is um, um, working towards performance right now, right, we'd be in a different position right now. I hold a contract with a single entity to, to get that into compliance. And so that would be where, where it would be a risk for me to, to owner furnish that equipment. So Rob, I saw you smiling when uh, when Jeff's talking about the owner taking on the risk um, with an owner furnished piece of equipment. Uh, so so tell me how how you as a contractor um, kind of evaluate that and look at projects that have either owner furnished um, and which seems like kind of a win for the contractor a little bit because of that risk transfer or a base bid. Um, which is a little bit more, I think, of a hybrid between the two. Yeah, we, we see uh, the owner selecting the equipment, at least from our perspective, uh, either because it's a super long lead piece of equipment and they don't want the hit on the schedule or to help them finish the design. Uh, if it's a, specifically, if it's a very complicated job, it can help them solidify the design more. Or the last item is if they have six of them and they want one, the final one to match, you know, they're all good reasons to sole source. Uh, and they, it can have a positive aspect on the con on the contract. It can, you know, decrease the time period for construction. It can provide more complete uh, plans and specifications for bidding. But then like Jeff said, there's also risk that the owner takes, um, Typically, if the owner buys it, then they will have a lot more exposure as far as, you know, what happens if something doesn't ship when it's supposed to, then, you know, the contractor is going to ask for more money for additional time. If something's wrong with the equipment when it shows up, you know, if it's a hard bid, open, uh, you know, equipment spec, the owner is going to look at, at the contractor and say, well, it's your issue, figure it out. You still have LDs coming. But if it's something that the owner procured, now it's uh, the owner gets to figure it out and has to pay the contractor while the contractor sits around. Um, and, and we don't see the owner's contracts with these vendors, uh, but they don't seem to have the same teeth. Uh, you know, as it comes out, you know, in a hard bid, we attach the whole contract to it and have all the LDs attached. Uh, it doesn't seem like from our perspective that contractor or the cities purchase orders with them have the same teeth. It seems like they're able to get away with more. That's the outside view. And, and Rob, when you say, you, you know, you, you pat, you, you attach the full contract, are you attaching the owner's con you know, the contract you would sign with the owner in terms of LDs and such. And so you're, yeah. you're attaching that with your vendors. Um, yeah, they have the same contract we did at bid time. So we'll tie them to the whole thing, LDs, the schedule, everything. So what about on the, the other approach with, with a base bid or an A-list or um, where an owner and an engineer uh, has definitely designed around, a, and I'm not talking pumps here, Let's t we're talking about a bigger piece of equipment that's more um, specific and unique. Like 
what would really drive you as you're trying to win this job, um, besides the obvious cost, um, what would drive you to um, bid an alternate to the A, um, to the A list? Given, given what we talked about earlier of, you know, you potentially have, are on the hook for some of the costs of the redesign and things like that. Well, obviously, you know, in competitive bidding, you have to do anything you can to get a job because you can't make money on a job you didn't get. So uh, the whole idea behind trying to find a different way to, you know, find a B or a C that's accept that you think will be acceptable and that you can make the changes uh, relatively quickly and cheaply uh, while still providing a, a cost benefit to the owner uh, at bid time. Um, that's your whole goal. Uh, like I said, it's really tough to evaluate at bid time because you might not get the scopes till late. Really, um, some specialty equipment and some vendors and reps get it. Like if they want to propose an alternate, they'll start reaching out to you early and try and work through some of the issues so that you're comfortable with it at bid time when you're evaluating other scopes. So really it's if somebody reaches out early and says, hey, we really wanna you know, show the owner this equipment, we're gonna put our best foot forward, what can we do to, to make the contractor comfortable? Uh, so we see that sometimes and, and that can help with the uh, last minute evaluation and, and make us more comfortable with what we put on a, on a bid form for a B or a C list, listed equipment. So and, reach and Rob, go ahead, Brett. Yeah, I was going to say, so Rob, in that situation, then I, I imagine that if the relationship that you have with the, the manufacturer's rep right, with a Chris uh, or with the vendor directly, depending on the nature of the system, is a, is a driver there. Yeah, I mean, if it's somebody we work with somewhat regularly, it's a lot easier. I mean, if it's somebody you don't know at all and they're reaching out from a different area, it's going to take a lot longer to build that relationship and that trust. And they're going to have to provide a lot more documentation for you to be comfortable with it. One other, one other piece I wanted to add in um, with what you said, Rob, about the, you know, the owners not being, not seeing the owner's contract, the schedule impact uh, of doing an, uh, a pre-select or owner procurement uh, is that the, uh, the engineering specifications like the motor spec, the VFD spec, the INC package control system spec, because it's a long lead item, we might be putting out an RFP for that equipment. And maybe between the owner and the and the consultant, we haven't developed those those real detailed specifications for that 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 equipment. And so that poses a little bit of a chicken and an egg when you get to the, the proposal. Um, and um, and so I guess you know what I've seen is that there there ends up being has to be some adjudication of that or adjustment through the design process. Even if you have done a pre-select or owner procurement, there ends up you'd kind of want to see some adjustments uh, so that you get the real technical uh, you know equipment that matches motors that match or um, you know controls that interface well with your with the plant system. Uh, that maybe weren't, couldn't be developed enough given the, the time span to put that into the equipment request for proposal. Well, I think if, um, if you have time, you know, after your submittals are approved, you know, you can make some of those updates depending on, you know, the length of time for the procurement of this, you know, one-off equipment, super specialty. Uh, but yeah, not always. So uh, I guess I'm gonna flip the, que the question around a little bit, Rob, like if an owner um, or, or a package comes out in a design bid build that does have an A-list, um, do you even bother to look for an alternative? I mean, you know, or does that kind of, does that kind of highlight to you like, hey, the owner's already doing that that's they they know what they want i'm just going to give them what they want and kind of move on that can get back to the client uh, you know some clients and engineers uh, know a lot more what they want and and aren't open you know despite that they list it aren't really as open to a b and a c uh, and that 
can come out, you know, during the pre-bid meeting or that kind of situation. So you have to feel that out with the owner and engineer to get an idea if you are wasting your time. And Chris, what do you think? <laughs> like, since you're the one who's uh, like, sort of same question to you, like, you know, do you bother, do you bother? Well, yeah, no, I, I, I think that, you know, there, there has to be a driver, right? I mean, uh, we, we get this all the time from manufacturers saying there's a project out there and, and going through and they, they want to be listed or they want to be an or equal. And the question would be, is there really a justifiable reason why it would be considered with the contractor, right? Have you done business with them? Do they, do they have a trust established that you're going to support them through the process? Uh, is there, a, is there a, a delta in the price, right? There has to be some real drivers there. Is, is 10%, you know, CapEx a, enough to, to be able to drive that conversation? Sometimes, yes, on big equipment, but usually on the widget, uh, a pump, a blower, a VFD, things like that, it's, it's a non-conversation piece, right? I guess from that, one of the things I would ask is that I think that, that every bid package is unique uh, the way that it's designed to Dan, from your, from your standpoint, do you think that, that all, um, uh, cities, agencies, do they get to see those numbers from a, a list and stuff, or those numbers kind of move through the contractor with markups? Cause sometimes those numbers aren't directly reflective in what is shown. Right. Um, you know, if, if Rob's never worked with me and I give him a piece of equipment that he's never heard of, but he's done 20 projects with the other one and I'm, you know, 20% less, that's a huge risk on his side. Mm -hmm. So depending on how the bids worked up, he may put a contingency on that number saying, I've never been down the road with these guys, right? If the numbers are shown directly to what he receives and they're, they're shown, you know, to the client, to the agency, it's a different conversation. Yeah. And I, I would say just to, depends on how the bid forms put together right as to what information we get which typically on a design bid build it's lump sum with maybe a few as we've been talking about you know basis of bid items or something like that um, so you know i would say that i at least in my experience on the projects that i've delivered here we don't see vendor quotes between contractor and and vendor so we only have a few minutes left and I did do have a question from the audience. So it says when an owner furnished equipment PO is assigned to the contractor that does not adequately recover, cover the risk, what are some strategies to cover the gaps? Can you repeat that? Sorry. So when an owner furnished piece of equipment PO is instead of the owner actually buying the equipment, but the, the PO is actually just assigned directly to you to to purchase the equipment, even though it's already selected. So that PO doesn't re adequately recover the risk that you think is required to, um, to procure that equipment. How would you um, cover the potential gaps there? So when it comes out with the bid package, we still try to tie them to the complete pan plans and specs and the liquidated damages associated with our contract. And honestly, you know, looking back over the years, the success on that goes up and down. Uh, you know, if it's somebody the owner's already selected, uh, you know, half the time they're going to be like, well, they already selected us. We don't have to agree to this. We already have this. The other half of the time they're like, yeah, we understand. And, you know, it gets back to the relationship uh, that they want to build with, you know, the engineer and the contractor and the owner. If it's a one-off thing and you're never going to see them again, they're probably not going to care. But if they want to continue to do business with, you know, this group of individuals, they're, they're more willing to to work with you and, and uh, help you get to where you need to go. And I, can, I can see how you lose a little bit of that leverage though, um, if it's, they've already sort of won the job. Yeah, um, but you know, owners and engineers realize that and are usually helpful. And you know, if you need an extra letter or you need you know, a nudge to help, uh, they realize that they, they handed you this and they're uh, more willing to help than if it's something you handed them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would say too, when I was on the client side and we see it a lot too, that usually, you know, what we're talking about is big procurement of major pieces of equipment. So it's a sizable contract um, where the LDs are a source associated with a much bigger contract. Um, 
that usually, you know, retainage is held on those major purchases. And I would say that those benchmarks, depending on how that is uh, designed, I would make sure that, you know, 10, 15% of that is left at the tail end after performance testing and startup and everything that's held against the manufacturer. We see that as a common practice. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we are just about out of time here. So thanks everyone for joining us on Really, it's just a conversation that the uh, five of us generally have over beers. Um, so, uh, about these different methods. So, um, thanks for joining us, and and hopefully, we got some uh, information and some different perspectives out there. Thanks, everybody. Yes.